And section 4.3 covers the addition rule for probabilities. This section presents the addition rule as a device for finding probabilities that can be expressed as the probability of A or B. That means the probability that either event A occurs or event B occurs, or they can both occur. This is not an exclusive or. This is an inclusive or, meaning you could have more than one thing happen. That's what we call a compound event, any event combining two or more simple events. Event A would be the first simple event. Event B would be the second simple event. The notation we're going to use is as follows, the probability of A or B. You may also see notation that looks like this, A union B. In the world of set notation, union is the symbol that we use for or. If you see the intersection of two events, the notation would look like this, the probability of A and B. And the key word here is and. It has to be in both events at the same time. This is or. It's an inclusive or, either A or B or both. But the intersection is only in A and B. The general rule for a compound event says when finding the probability that event A occurs or event B occurs, find the total number of ways A can occur and the total number of ways that B can occur, but find that total in such a way that no outcome is counted more than once. So here's an example. This says the table below summarizes results from a study of people who refuse to answer survey questions. A pharmaceutical company is interested in opinions of the elderly. What is the probability that the selected subject is someone over 60 and who responded? So here's your first event, that they're over 60. This would be event A, and they responded. That would be event B. So we would look at this table of all the people that were surveyed and define the probability, in this case, of A and B, we would take the number of elements in A and B, and we would divide it by the number of elements in our sample space. The sample space would be everybody that was surveyed. Did they tell us how many people were surveyed here? No. But could we figure it out by looking at the table? How do you figure out the total number of people that were surveyed? Add up all the numbers. Can somebody do that for us right quick? Now looking at this table, I wanted to know the probability that they're over 60 and they responded. So how many would that be? 202. They're over 60 and responded. So that would be equal to what for the probability? 202 divided by 1249 is 162. So that's the probability that they're over 60 and responded. What about the probability that they're over 60 or they responded? This is a different question now. Probability that they're over 60 or they responded. So here's the people that are over 60, and here's the people that responded. We need everything that's highlighted in yellow, but we don't want to count this 202 twice. One way we can do this is we can take the, and find the probability that they're over 60 plus the probability that they responded. If we do this, this would be the probability that they're, oops, i got to do the over 60, hang on. Probability that they're over 60 would be this group right here, right? The probability that they responded would be this group right here. Didn't somebody get counted twice? The people who are over 60 and responded, right? So what we would want to do then is take away, we'll count the yellow, count the blue, but take away the probability that they're over 60 and they responded. We'll take away the green once because it got counted twice. This is called the addition rule for probabilities. That's the formal addition rule. I just wanted to see if I could kind of get you to see why it makes sense this way. The 202 got counted once with the responders, once with the over 60s, and we only wanted to count them one time, not twice, so we take them away once. Now, if our two events, being over 60 and responding, were disjoint, we could have just added the two probabilities together because there wouldn't be any overlap. But the reason we had to take away the overlap is because that was this region right in here that got counted twice. It got counted once with the red, once with the yellow. 
we had to take it away one time with the intersection. So these events that are disjoint means they have nothing in common. Decide whether the following two events are disjoint. See if you understand the concept. Randomly selecting a nurse and randomly selecting an, a male. A, you claim it's A. Why do you claim it's A? You can select a male nurse. They're not disjoint, right? There are male nurses. Determine whether the two events are disjoint for a single trial. Consider disjoint to be equivalent to separate or non-overlap. So here, randomly selecting a statistics student and getting someone who brings a pencil to class, and random, or randomly selecting a statistics student and getting someone who brings a notebook to class. Are the events disjoint? A also, they're, they're not disjoint because they can occur at the same time. We have stat students that bring notebooks and pencils. All right, let's look at another problem. It says the following data lists the numbers of correct and wrong dosage amounts calculated by 31 physicians. In a research experiment, a group of 18 physicians was given bottles of epinephrine labeled with a concentration of one milligram in one milliliter solution, and another group of 13 physicians was given bottles with a ratio of one milliliter of a one to 1,000 solution. If one of the physicians is randomly selected, what is the probability of getting one who calculated the dose correctly? Is that probability as high as it should be? Here's the, the first question. What is the probability of getting one who calculated the dose correctly? What we can do is total this up here if you want and that might help. This is called a contingency table. So going across on the concentration labeled, we had a total of 18, and um, on the other ratio we had 13. Total correct dose would be 16, and wrong dose would be 15, and the totals here are 31. Is that correct? Yep. What is the probability of getting one who calculated the dose correctly? It would be 16 out of how many? 16 out of 31. And give me a decimal for that. Is that as high as it should be? Why not? I don't want my doctor to be able to give me the correct dose of medicine. More than a 50-50 shot, right? But does it look like the way they label the bottle would change or affect the chances of the doctor giving the correct dose? Which pharmaceutical companies would want to know this because they would want the doctors to give the correct dosage. So then they would look at this result and say, ooh, maybe we should label the bottles like this as opposed to the second way, the ratio label. Use the concentration instead of the ratio. All right, we've already talked about complementary events. So let's look at a problem now. It says, find the indicated complement. A certain group of women has a 0.42% rate of red-green color blindness. If a woman is randomly selected, what is the probability that she does not have red-green color blindness? This is 0.42%. This is already written as a percent. 0.42% is equivalent to 0 0.0042, 0 0.9958. That would be the complement. It's 1 minus 0 0.0042. To find the complement of an event, remember the probability of the complement is going to be 1 minus the probability of the event. So here, the way we came up with this number was we looked at 1 minus 0 0.0042. So here's a nice picture that kind of explains the complementary rule for events. And we've already gone over this and discussed it in the previous section, but the probability of an event and its complement is equal to 1 because the total area here is equal to 1. That's why we say the probability of the sample space is equal to 1. The total area there represents the sample space. And event A is just a subset of that sample space. Use the following results from a test for marijuana use, which is provided by a certain drug testing company. It says among 141 subjects with positive test results, there are 26 false positive results. Among 50, 156 negative results, there are two false negatives. If one of the test subjects is randomly selected, find the probability that that subject tested negative or did not use marijuana. They tell us to construct a table. The table you should construct would look like this. We have the test outcome. You could have a positive or a negative. And we have the test result. It could be correct or it could be incorrect. So we were told that 
141 subjects had positive test results. So over here for the totals, we have 141 subjects that had positive test results. 26 had false positives. That means that they tested positives, but the results were incorrect. Agree? So what number do I put and where? 26 under incorrect. If this number is 26, how many of those 141 tests were correct then? Now, we were also told that among the 156 negative results, there were two false negatives. A false negative means that it incorrectly showed negative. So how many people tested negative and it was correct? 154. So how many total people tested correct here? And how many total pe people ended up testing incorrectly? How many people were tested in general? 297, right? You just total these up. This column represents the totals. These are called marginals, by the way, where the totals are. This is called a contingency table. All right, so we're told if one of the test subjects is randomly selected, find the probability that the subject tested negative or did not use marijuana. So here, event A would be a negative test. Event B did not use marijuana. So we're asked to find the probability of A or B, A union B. Looking at this table, how might we do that? We would want to add together. These would be the negatives right here. Agree? And then that did not use. We've got to pick up another group of people. Positive and incorrect. These people didn't use. If they tested positive, and they didn't use, they would have an incorrect result. So just looking at the table, I think this would be fairly easy to add up without trying to come up with a formula. Just look at the table. Remember, when we find probability, if we take the number of elements in our event and divide by the number of elements in our sample space. Well, in our event, we have to add together the 26, the 154, and the 2. So when we add those together, what do we get? 182, it's 156 plus 26. And we divide by what? The 297. The total number in our sample space is 297. So when you get your calculators out and you do this, what do we get for our probability? So this is the probability that a randomly selected subject either tested negative or did not use. This is just organizing the information into a table as opposed to a Venn diagram. I could have drawn a Venn diagram to represent the same thing. Let me show you what the Venn diagram would look like if we drew that. I would have one circle here that would represent positive. So I'd let this represent positive. And then I would have another circle that represents correct or incorrect. So we'll let this be correct. So those who tested positive and incorrect would actually end up in this area right here. So that would be 26 that were both positive and incorrect. I meant incorrect. It's easier to change that than the number. I meant incorrect. Um, so that would be 26 that tested positive and incorrect. This region of the circle right here would represent what group? The ones that tested positive and actually should be positive. So that would be the 115. This region right here would be what group? Incorrect negative, so two. And who would be this group out here? Correct negatives, and that would be 154. So you can use the information, you can either use a Venn diagram or a contingency table to summarize your information. It's just an easier way to make sense however you want to organize it. See, to me, this problem, just reading the information in a paragraph, it all runs together. It gets muddled together. I can't organize it because I just see a bunch of words. But by pulling out the pertinent information and organizing it either in a table or a Venn diagram, it's easier for me then to answer questions about it and find probabilities. That's why this hint is here. And you didn't have to do a table. Tables are easy, though. They just require some practice.